One evening in the early 70s, a trio took the stage at the Batley Variety Club that was dubbed the Las Vegas of the North, uh, located in the blue-collar mill town of West Yorkshire, England. Now, this was supposed to be an exciting hometown show for them to perform a set of their greatest hits, but it turned out to be a demoralizing indicator of where their career stood at that very moment. The attendees were more interested in eating and getting drunk than listening. There was no question about it. This group was struggling mightily with a string of three consecutive albums that were commercial failures. I mean, most groups would have called it quits at this point or gotten kicked out of their record deal. But the adversity made the bond between these brothers stronger than ever. It's the story of how one of the most successful acts of the rock and roll era literally crossed over a bridge to reinvent themselves. You'll get that later. And then they rose to the zenith of the record industry. Great story coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you love music, the legends, the stories behind the songs, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you're going to love this channel. Make sure to hit the red button below, click the bell, subscribe so that you always know when our latest videos are coming out. Also, check us out on Patreon. So it's time for another edition of our show, Breakthrough. This is where we break down songs, albums, or events that kicked open the door to an artist or band's career for longevity. Uh, previous episodes we've covered, Do You Believe in Love by Huey Lewis in the News. Do you in love? Do you? Boys Don't Cry by The Cure. Boys don't cry. And West End Girls by Pet Shop Boys. Now, today we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, this band had already broken through, but then they began to fade into obscurity. Then they had a second breakthrough that would make them one of the biggest groups ever. It was a beautiful afternoon in August of 1970 when Robin Gibb went over to his brother Barry's house to reunite after a falling out between the two it caused an 18-month breakup of the Bee Gees. Felt really good to get back together as brothers and to rekindle their artistic collaboration. Uh, the elation they enjoyed during that pivotal visit led to the writing of an emotionally charged ballad titled, How Can You Mend a Broken Heart? How can you mend a broken heart? Great song. Robin and Barry phone Maurice. Robin's fraternal twin and the ever congenial third member of the trio, and soon the brothers Gibb went to the studio to create the song. Their first thought was to offer the tune to popular crooner Andy Williams. Moon River. They decided to record it for themselves as the foundation to an album of new material. The following year, August of 1971, Barry and Robin's reconciliation piece, How Can You Mend a Broken Heart, went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, and it also went to number one on the Adult Contemporary chart. Please help me mend my it was certainly an exciting time for the Bee Gees. They had the rush of having the number one record in America and a smash across the world. But when the euphoria faded, the band floundered, with no idea of where they were going to go next. Barry put their state of mind in perspective when he admitted that if the Bee Gees were not brothers, they would have broken up. It was actually their brotherhood that kept them going. On the heels of the huge success of How Can You Mend a Broken Heart, the Bee Gees label at the time Atlantic Records begged for more of the same. So the guys, in an effort to give the label what they wanted, they continued to write. And uh, they continued to write what Barry called dreary ballads. The dreariness, as it were, pigeonholed the Bee Gees. As the 70s evolved, their music became passe and their popularity significantly declined. Three consecutive Bee Gees albums that followed, Trafalgar, uh, the LP that featured How Can You Mend a Broken Heart, uh, they were commercial flops. In fact, one of those three misfires, a kick in the head is worth eight in the pants, were summarily rejected by the Bee Gees manager, Robert Stigwood, and permanently shelved. Wouldn't I be someone, someone? Perhaps the darkest moment for the Bee Gees during that period of futility was when the brothers were booked to perform a string of shows at the Batley Variety Club in the dingy mill town of West Yorkshire, England. 
Uh, it was supposed to be uh, kind of a homecoming series for the Bee Gees, you know, since the concerts would be back in their home country. Uh, the Batley Variety Club was dubbed the Las Vegas of the North, uh, with a consistent flow of superstar acts filling the event schedule at that point. But the opportunity turned into a major disappointment for the Brothers Gibb. Uh, this is when the disinterested audience, you know, they seemed to care more about eating and getting drunk than the greatest hit set that the boys were passionately performing on the stage. Robert Stigwood navigated the career of the Bee Gees since uh, 1967, and he didn't want to give up on these brothers, despite years of dismal returns at that point. An artistic intervention was clearly imperative for the future of the Bee Gees. Stigwood needed to shake up the boys into recognizing how the music scene had dramatically changed from the prosperity that they enjoyed in the 60s. Listen to what's happening in the world today, admonished Stigwood, addressing the band with scolding urgency. The storied leaders of Atlantic Records, Ahmet Erdogan and Jerry Wexler, they bought into Robert Stigwood's plan for a new musical direction for the Bee Gees, suggesting that they were you know, to work with coveted producer and arranger Arif Mardin. Uh, the idea was for Mardin to tap into the Gibb brothers, uh, their love for rhythm and blues, and incorporate you know, a fresh R&B energy to their music. One of the first things that Mardin did when he met with the brothers to discuss the making of their crucial main course album in January of 75 was to turn their attention to the burgeoning dance scene and encourage them to adapt their arrangements to a more upbeat style. Now, Arif Mardin, while being a highly respected producer and along with Tom Dowd and Wexler, was an architect for the so-called Atlantic Sound, A Mardin's name on a vinyl disc did not mean success was an absolute certainty. I mean, after all, Mardin produced Mr. Natural, the third consecutive flop for the Bee Gees and those three straight that I talked about. Uh, Mr. Natural was the worst selling LP for the Bee Gees in the 70s, actually. The two singles from Mr. Natural fell miserably. Only the title track with Robin on lead vocal broke the Hot 100, clanking in at uh, number 93. Still, despite the dismal sells of Mr. Natural, the album focused the Bee Gees on creating a vital new sound, and that was an important transition for them. When the Bee Gees began working on tracks for main course, they stayed true to form, writing songs like they always did, with many of the early tunes being presented as slow ballads, much to the chagrin of Arif Mardin. They needed something that would jolt them out of their bubble and into new musical territory. The inspiration would come from a very unlikely place, or maybe it was an ear-opening moment of destiny. As we get into this, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses I always wear, and Zenny Rocks. Right now, you can get a complete pair of Zenny glasses for just $6.95. You can choose three pair for less than the price of a vinyl record. Check it out today at our link below, or download Zenny's new app on your phone. Now, the Bee Gees were desperate for a comeback, a desire that their friend uh, Eric Clapton could wholeheartedly relate to. Uh, Clapton encouraged the brothers to change their environment by leaving England and record main course of the Criteria Studios in Miami. Change of pace there. Just like the Bee Gees, Clapton's career was on the downturn at the time. Uh, he made the bold decision to move to Miami to record his comeback album, 461 Ocean Boulevard at Criteria Studios. And uh, the change of scenery worked wonders for Clapton's revival, both professionally and personally, after he recovered from a serious cocaine and heroin addiction. Uh, 461 uh, Ocean Boulevard, named after the physical address of Criteria Studios, that was a triumph for Clapton. It featured his version of Bob Marley's I Shot the Sheriff. It was a huge number one smash, selling over a million 45s in America alone. I shot the sheriff, but I did each day, to get to Criteria Studios from their hotel, uh, the Bee Gees had to cross Briskane Bay via the Julia Tuttle Crossway Bridge. Now, the sound of the car tires rolling across the metal planks of the bridge made a chunka 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 sound. One evening, during the 4.4-mile excursion over the Julia Tuttle Causeway Bridge, Barry's wife, Linda, who accompanied her husband, in Miami during the main course recording sessions, turned to Barry and said, listen to that noise. It's the same noise every evening. It's our drive talking. <laughs> Barry paused 
you know, listening intently to the chunka chunka road noise. And he began singing the words, it's just our drive talking. At that evolutionary moment, the song originally titled Drive Talking was born. The guys went into the studio the same night and worked on Drive Talking with Mardine and the Bee Gees band, which uh, was comprised of Alan Kendall, Danny Bryan, and Blue Weaver. Enthusiastically, they embraced the song's potential to be a true dance hit. Upon playback, the band thought that they heard Barry singing uh, Jive Talking, not Drive Talking. And they actually thought they should change the title of Jive Talking, since they had heard the term Jive bandied about in the clubs. Funny thing is, Barry, Robin, and Maurice thought Jive was a term for dancing, inducing Barry to come up with the lyric Jive Talking, you dance with your eyes. Now, when Barry sang the line to Arif Mardin, it's just your Jive Talking. That gets in the way. He asked them if they knew what jive meant. You guys know what that means? Of course, when they told Arif that they thought jive meant to dance, the producer just laughed. No, jive is urban slang for lying. And with that revelation of credible street lexicon, Barry switched the lyric to it's just your jive talking. You're telling me lies, yeah. It's just your jive. Jive Talking was written about a deceptive lover derived from fiction. When the song was composed in 1975, Barry had already been happily married to Linda for about five years. The relationship between Barry and Linda Gibb, a former Miss Edinburgh beauty queen, is one of the greatest romances of the rock era. The couple have been married for more than 52 years at this point. Now, to replicate the chunking rhythm that they heard with the turning wheels driving across the Julia Tuttle Causeway Bridge, uh, Barry employed a prominent Bo Diddley beat to a fuzzy guitar riff that resembled the one heard on Shame, 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 uh, a number one soul hit by Shirley and Company released in 1974. The overall vibe of Jive Talking was also influenced by the Sly Stone composition, You're the One, recorded by the band Little Sister. The pulsating bass that permeates throughout Jive Talk and was an early adoption of the synth bass in a pop recording. Uh, it was cutting edge technology back in the early to mid 70s. Uh, I have to give Stevie Wonder the bow down for pioneering that sound. Uh, his synth bass work was incredible on iconic tracks like, of course, Superstition, Higher Ground, which we just covered, and You Haven't Done Nothing. It was Maurice that came up with that nasty bass line. Mo usually played bass guitar on Bee Gees tracks, but he happened to be away from the studio on the evening when keyboardist Blue Weaver overdubbed several sections of the synth bass tracks to the original demo of Jive Talking, uh, using a state-of-the-art ARP 2600 synthesizer that Arif Mardin brought to the studio for main course recording sessions. When Mo returned to the studio the following day, Weaver played what he had overdubbed, and he suggested that Mo re-record it playing the bass line on his bass guitar. Mo loved what he heard, and his bass guitar parts were overdubbed to accentuate Jive Talkin's gyrating dance groove. Oh, you let him know. The Bee Gees pilfered uh, Blue Weaver from Mott the Hoople, actually, and he became a valuable member of their recording team, as well as a staple in the group's touring unit from 1975 through 1979. Main Course was the first Bee Gees record to include the talents of Blue Weaver, highlighted by his accentuated keyboard playing in Jive Talkin'. <music> Jive Talkin' manifested a new dimension of Barry Gibbs' vocal versatility. His lead vocal on the track was different from his trademark tenderness on the older Bee Gees ballads. Uh, on Jive Talk, and Barry delivered his breathy soulfulness with a, a full-body rock edge that attracted a younger, trend-setting audience. Oh, child, know. The reinvention of the Bee Gees was further demonstrated by the birth of Barry Gibbs' iconic falsetto. 
This is where it all started. Arif Mardin is credited for discovering Barry's uh, latent vocal skill. There were brushes of his falsetto on the backing vocal track on Dogs, a cut from Mr. Natural. But Barry's hidden ability really came out in the background vocals on the second single from Main Course, uh, the number seven pop hit, Nights on Broadway. Mardine followed his expert instincts and wanted Barry to execute a scream in the song's coda to fatten the vocal on Nights on Broadway. And when Barry unleashed his falsetto, the sound that he produced just stunned him. He had no idea that he could command his voice to do such a thing, to do that. Barry soon realized that he had the ability to sustain his falsetto throughout an entire song. Showcased on the lead single from Children of the World, the album that followed main course. It was yet another monster number one smash, You Should Be Dancing. Barry Gibbs' famous falsetto pushed to the forefront, galvanizing the vitality of the new Bee Gees. When the final mixing and mastering of Jive Talking was finished, the Bee Gees team knew they had made an extraordinary record with tremendous hit potential. They just, they just felt it in their bones. It was exactly the kind of track that Robert Stigwood, Arif Mardin, and the Brothers Gibb were aiming for in the first place. A song that would change the image of the Bee Gees and you know, vault them into the white hot spotlight like never before. Jive Talking would be the lead single from Main Course and uh, designed to be an emblem for the new sound of the Bee Gees. As perfect as Jive Talking was, they still faced the difficult challenge of you know, trying to get it played on the radio. Remember, this was the spring of 75, and the Bee Gees were cold as ice at this point. To the radio tastemakers, yeah, the trio represented the banal music of the past. You know, they were looking for the hottest new happenings, not another sappy ballad. Jive Talking could become the hottest single on the radio, but the gatekeepers would certainly snub their nose in a new Bee Gees record. You know, they'd probably toss the 45 in the Nevermind stack, as it were. Stigwood in the RSO Records promo squad implemented a strategy, though, that had worked well back in 1967 with the launch of another Bee Gees record, the U.S. debut single of New York Mining Disaster. Have you seen? Jive Talking was delivered to radio stations in a plain white cover with no information about the artist performing on the disc. DJs had to play the song on a turntable to have any idea what it would sound like or who recorded it. It was a mystery. The stunt worked brilliantly for the second time. DJs were instantly smitten by Jive Talking. The adrenaline rush they felt after one listen of the mysterious white label track propelled them to put the song on the air as soon as possible. When DJs discovered that Jive Talking was a new song by the Bee Gees, they couldn't believe their ears, but they also could not deny that the song was a stone cold smash. Jive Talking, it blasted to number one on the Billboard Hot 100, stayed at the top for two weeks. It was also a number one sensation in Canada and top five in the UK and throughout the rest of the world. The massive success of Jive Talking ignited one of the most phenomenal five-year runs by any act during the rock era. I mean, the Bee Gees were suddenly on fire, reeling off a string uh, of 12 straight top 15 hits from about May 75 to May of 79. Eight of those went to number one. If the Bee Gees had never heard the clackety road noise from the you know, tires rolling across the Julia Tuttle Causeway Bridge, Jive Talking doesn't happen. And therefore, it's easy to deduce that the Bee Gees would never have had the, the spectacular success they achieved in the 70s. With more weeks on the Billboard Hot 100 in that decade than any other act, with the exception of one Elton John. I gotta believe with their enormous talent and their rebuilt bond of brotherhood, the Bee Gees would have broken through in some other fashion. I mean, really. They are undoubtedly on the short list of the greatest songwriters in popular music history. 
could have simply continued to write hits songs for other artists like they often did when the trio were unfairly victimized by the disco backlash that happened in the summer of 79. The Bee Gees were so much more than a family of brothers that had gifted three-part harmony. They were a pop culture movement that pegged the needle for a generation of music fans, uh, comparable to the frenzy of Beatlemania in the 60s. Barry and his late brothers, Robin and Maurice Gibb, represented everything that makes music such a powerful human-made force. It's the art form that arouses the five senses like no other stimulus. Play any number of timeless Bee Gees classics and you'll experience an invigorating blend of emotions and feelings, ranging from halcyon bliss to an uncontrollable urge to boogie. In 2021, Barry arranged reworkings of the Bee Gees' greatest hits with country and rock singers. His guest vocalist titled Greenfields, the Gibb Brothers Songbook Volume 1. Uh, the inspired album serves as a tribute to Robin, Maurice, and Andy. It also includes a reimagining of Jive Talking with a country blue spirit, something that Barry had wanted to do for a long time. He always thought that some of their compositions were meant to be country, actually, which makes sense when you think of Islands in the Stream. Performing with Barry on the Greenfields version of Jive Talkin' is Country Entertainer of the Year Award winner Miranda Lambert and Rival Sons lead vocalist Jay Buchanan. Sadly, now the brothers Gibb remain at just one living member, Barry. But their music always lives on. Every time I hear Jive Talkin' by the Bee Gees, I think of my dad who told me this very story of their comeback and how a number one hit came from the, the way the tires hit the road. It's proof that inspiration can come anytime and anyhow and anywhere. You just have to be in tune. Leave us a comment about the Bee Gees and Jive Talking. Do you remember this song? What are your thoughts on the Bee Gees three act career? Let us know in the comments below. Let us know what you think about this amazing story about the tires. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below to be a permanent part of our community. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. <laughs>